Okay, welcome everybody to the final panel at the AI Music Creativity Conference. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the whole series of events. I know I have um, some fantastic papers, fantastic spotlight talks, two really great keynote talks. And this final uh, panel session is about the future of this conference. And uh, where do we go from here? We have an agenda. The first item on the agenda is to start with introductions. So I will specify uh, somebody to introduce themselves. We'll go around and say who we are, how we're involved in either Moomi or CSMC. And uh, let's start with uh, Roshane. Hey, um, hi, uh, my name is Roshane Lochran. I'm based in Ireland, um, postdoc in creativity for about five years in UCD and now I'm actually based up in Dundalk IT. Uh, so I became involved with CS, I, I attended CSMC in, in Huddersfield uh, 2015 and I think became involved after that in 20, oh no sorry 2016 I was there, 20, then 2017 and I hosted it in Dublin then in 2018. Um, also started going to Moomia around the same time but 2015, 2016 I've been on the uh, program committee for both and I love both of them. So putting them together is, well, I like it. I'm, I'm very much a fan of this, I have to say. Um, I love both aspects of the two different different events and I think they've come together very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go now to Robin Laney. Hi, uh, I'm Robin Laney. Um, I'm from the UK. I work at the Open University. Um, the Open University hosted CSMC in um, 2017. And like Roshan, I very much welcome the two conferences coming together. I think there's so much in common, it's almost, it'd be, it's almost crazy to, to not be together at this point. So and I think it's gone really, really well this year. Great, uh, let's move on to uh, Philippe Pasquier. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, I'm I'm an, an associate professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, uh, Canada, and I've been uh, always fascinated as a musician for since '99 uh, by generative systems, starting with analog machines, and so um, and so I continued that when I became a faculty and became serious about the the research around it, and helped uh, Oli and Arnie to start uh, Mium, and we'll talk about that I think in a second. And, uh, and I also uh, chaired ISEA, the Symposium for Electronic Arts in, in Vancouver. And there was a thousand attendees and 10,000 audience members in collaboration with Mutech at the time. And I also started the movement computation community, which is, uh, which is growing into an ICM conference uh, as we speak and has been doing uh, really, really well. So that's my, uh, my academic service there uh, for you. Thank you. And uh, Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Jan. I'm based at the University of Huddersfield in the north of England, uh, speaking to you from Manchester. Uh, I've been involved with the CSMC uh, community from its outset um, with Valerio, uh, and I am a co-editor of the Journal of Creative Music Systems with Robin. Thank you. How about uh, Ollie? Greetings, everyone from Sydney. Um, I'm Ollie Bown, and I um, was one of the co-founders with Philippe and Arnie Eigenfeld, as Philippe mentioned, of um, of Moom back in 2012. Um, before that, I was uh, I did a PhD at Goldsmiths um, in the very early days of Goldsmiths, having its now very very lively um, music tech focus. Um, so back in those days, um, when I first joined there in around 2006, ages ago, um, there was Tim Blackwell and Michael Young who were both co-organizing something called the Live Algorithms for Music um, workshop or conference or research network, um, which was really my first taste. We had, um, in 2006, we had George Lewis and Evan Parker come and play um, with a bunch of live algorithm systems um, and so it's so there's been quite an interesting progression of terminology and and communities um so goldsmiths i moved to australia 
um, worked with Philippe and Arnie um, on the musical medication workshop and particularly my focus was on concerts um, and thinking about how you evaluate um, and, and organize concerts of AI music and, and um, meta creation systems. Um, and I will, I will admit freely that uh, for about the last three years, I've been working more in other areas, but without any intention of, of leaving this field, but I've been just getting distracted uh, and with a baby. Um, but I'm very, very happy to see this community really kick off as well as the whole field itself really going quite crazy at the moment. And don't forget your book. And there's a book coming out next year at some point. Big part, all right. Okay, let's go to uh, Valerio. So, hi guys, so I'm Valerio. I speak from Berlin, but I'm originally from Italy. So I'm currently working as a senior data scientist at a Brussels company called Musimo, and we do like music information retrieval in AI music there. Uh, before that, I co-founded my startup called uh, Melodrive, and we were doing generative music for kind of like uh, video games and kind of like generating music in real time that could really adapt to uh, the scenes and the narrative of a video, video game. And uh, before that, I used to be a student uh, of Stevens. So Stephen was my, Stephen Jan was my PhD supervisor and I was doing a PhD like with a focus on generative music. And during those years, we decided to co-found together uh, the CSM, CSMC uh, conference. So this is my kind of relation to that conference. Thank you. Uh, Artemy. Um, hi, I'm Artemy Yotti, and I am a composer and artistic researcher at the Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics in Graz, Austria. Um, I participated at the Music Meta Creation Workshop uh, a while ago, about three years ago, but the main reason I'm here is that I will be hosting um, the second conference on AI music creativity in Graz in 2021. But there will be more information on that at the end of this panel discussion. So stay tuned. Okay, the cat's out of the bag. Thanks, Artemy. Thanks, everybody. My name is Bob Sturm. I'm an associate professor of computer science at KTH in Stockholm. It would have been lovely to have you all here in Stockholm. Uh, but I think we've made do with the circumstance and, and have a uh, have had a great week. So now that we've finished with the introductions, I'd like to invite the viewers to uh, comment on a few things in the Slack channel devoted to this panel. Uh, one is how have you found the union of these two conferences this year? And how have you found the online format? Perhaps there are some suggestions uh, for uh, ways to improve this for next year, whether it's in uh, person, online, or a hybrid type um, of a uh, conference. So at, at this time, while you're typing in that, I'd like to ask now, oh, I've also attended both Mumi and CSMC a few times each and have really been impressed with the, uh, the differences and the similarities at Mumi, there's always a creative element of concerts at the end. It's a daily a workshop and then a concert at the end. Uh, with CSMC, you had an academic flavor conference with uh, perhaps some concerts in the middle of the day. Uh, but I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring them together this year. So with that, I'd like to ask Philippe and Oli maybe to discuss about the origins of Mumi, the history of it. Thanks sure. a lot, Bob. Um, so I haven't prepared anything. I don't know if you have, Philippe, so we'll ad-lib we'll ad this. Um, I believe we started in 2012. So I, I think I met Arnie, um, first of all, in 2009 at ICMC. Maybe we met as well at that point, Philippe. Um, and Arnie and Philippe both based at Simon Fraser um, and working together already. Um, I almost took a job with them at some point. Um, I could have become a Canadian didn't happen. Um, and, but we, we schemed to, I guess, prior to that, I'd, I'd done a few individual concerts and things, um, uh, such as with the live algorithms, uh, community, uh, largely focused on improvised music, um, with 
you know, duets between musicians and algorithms. Um, and Philip, you, you're you're better equipped to talk about the um, uh, the aid relationship, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we yeah we started as a workshop with the um, the uh, Triple AI uh, Aid Conference, uh, which is a uh, Triple AI is is the large uh, American. Uh, AI conference, and then they have a, a bunch of satellite conferences. And then, um, yeah, we were still as a workshop there for two years. And then after that, uh, we thought that it was better to be with uh, ICCC. And um, I believe one year we took a break of the year of ISEA 2015 and then focused on concerts and tutorials. But what I wanted to say is we, it was not just the workshop and uh, and if only for a split seconds, because we, we don't want to get um, long here. I'll share the, the website here and uh, you can you can see that you have access to the workshops and the proceeding there, but there's also the concerts that were organized uh, each time, sometime with, with the workshops, sometime outside of the workshops. And we also gave some tutorials and tried to push in the AI community, in the NIME community, in various communities, uh, sort of be advocate of uh, music AI uh, uh, at, at the time. And we had one also journal uh, double special issue that was uh, curated uh, at the time, so I stop here. But uh, the website will will stay there with those uh, resources, and um, yeah, it's been fun. In fact, I'll still give one for possibly ultimate um, Yum tutorial at Ishkai uh, this year in January. I uh, we, I thought I would go to Japan for it, but uh, it's going to be online. And so it's probably worth talking about that relationship with other conferences. So we were we were a workshop with Aid. So that's a conference which. Uh, has in, in theory a broad remit, but very much basically a games conference. And um, we were very excited about the potential to work with the games community, and you know, in a sense, fit into that community with all the kind of commercial applications that might come out in terms of um, generative music. The reality of the conference was that it was one of those slightly um, siloed things because all the music people would turn up and do their workshop. Uh, typically didn't have papers in the main conference and um, in fact was there even a main conference maybe it was just an entirely multi-track uh, event um, uh, so it was a nice idea in theory and certainly some some connections were made um, but obviously it was really natural for us to fit into the ICCC world because we were all kind of everyone attending MUM was also attending ICCC for people who don't know that's the uh, International Conference on Computational Creativity um, and so, uh, and that was a much better fit because typically you, you might actually have a paper in both and you could focus the workshop paper on more experimental work. And we, and we never did a concert with the aid people actually, did we? Um, yeah. So in fact, in the, in the, in the earlier years, our concerts were happening at different times of year and in different contexts. So we did a, we did, an, a, a, uh, we did the musical meta creation weekend at the Sydney 2013 ICCC, um, uh, which was didn't have an academic track to it. It was just just music. Um, I think we talked for a long time about how it would be great to make this a standalone conference, um, but that's a big leap to make. And um, and I think that the the other thing is we looked at CMSC and we said, hey they're our enemy and then we said no they're not they're really lovely people um and we spoke to them quite a while ago i think about about the potential that these things should just come together because um there's not really that well, at the time there wasn't really enough space for two workshops or conferences now that's a bit different because there's a workshop in pretty much every other conference you go to about uh music and ai so It'd be interesting to ask people how they think that's really changing, how much they think the community is growing. But but I think that the ma the major is is really uh, nice and really positive to it, and that might be a concluding note on on the, on, on a part uh, on the behalf of the the, the Mume here is that uh, I I still believe like like I think we did at the beginning that there's a there's a community around um, generate generative music and uh, automation of musical tasks. Uh, and that, uh, as as has been shown this week, with the number of questions that were raised, there's enough uh, there for, in terms of scope, to really have a standalone conferences. So, so I, I think that this measure is, is well done, and and, uh, and I hope it's going to thrive in the future.
Thank you for that uh, history. I would like to ask uh, Stephen and Robin, and Robin to discuss the origins of CSMC now. Shall I kick off, Robin? Uh, yeah, I think that's best. Yeah, so um, the, the inception of this really came from an idea of Valerio's um, in 2015, uh, and we put on a study day uh, on computer simulation of musical creativity in June of 2015. Um, we were quite surprised at, at the level of interest it garnered, and we had several papers and um, a load of really interesting poster presentations. So we decided that the following year we would expand it to a kind of two and a half, three day conference. Um, so in 2016, we ran it again as a conference, again at the, the University of Huddersfield. Um, and again, that recruited really well. We had about 40, 45 attendees, which we thought were was a really good number given the relative novelty of the conference. Uh, we had two um, really good keynotes. We had Graham Bailey from Cornell and we had Geraint Wiggins from Queen Mary. Um, and then in the following year, uh, Robin hosted the conference at the Open University. Um, and whereas in the first iteration of the conference, we did have a, a concert, but it was human generated music, mainly from my colleagues at Huddersfield and their students. But in the conference in Milton Keynes that Robin convened in 2017, um, the concert had a significant generative music component, including uh, a performance by Roger Dean, uh, an improvised uh, co-generated uh, composition. Um, then in 2018, Roisin hosted the conference at UCD, um, and I think numbers really peaked then, and I think the quality of papers had been iteratively um, increasing. Um, we had two great keynotes from Tim Blackwell and Sarah Anglis. Um, and then in 2019, the plan was to have um, an iteration in Berlin hosted jointly by Mellor Drive and the Technical University, but for various um, logistical problems and because of the workload that Mellor Drive were under, that didn't come about. Um, so the conference was rested in that year. Meanwhile, in 2016, we thought it would be a, a good idea to launch a journal. So we launched the Journal of Creative Music Systems in 2016. Um, and I was co-editor with Eduardo Miranda. Um, the following year, Eduardo's work commitments meant that he had to step down. So uh, I approached Robin, uh, who kindly joined me and Valerio on the editorial team of that journal. Um, in the following year, 2018, we moved to a new journal management system called Janeway, um, developed by Birkbeck University, um, which made a lot of sense given that we'd had a very kind of primitive system before for managing uh, the journal. Um, Robin, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that or Valerio? So I think that from my point of view, that's a, a pretty good um, summary. I think, I think other than the fact we had the, the year rest, I think the thing has kind of evolved. Um, I think I mean, all the events have been very, very good. Um, I think all the events have been fairly varied in terms of content, in terms of, um, you know, science and art. And I think it's been a good blend. And, and, and I think this year, is, it's, it feels like a natural evolution. And I think it's been amazing this year. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say, really. Yeah, one thing that I would add is that I think like at the beginning, the idea that we had was try to uh, I don't know, like create this community of generative music, uh, people interested in gen and researchers interested in generative music here in Europe, because we felt that Mumi was kind of like moving like all over the world in a sense, right? So, and obviously like it was based like mainly in, in Northern America as well, uh, right? So like in Canada. And so like our, our objective at the beginning was just like to create like this community in Europe because we saw that at the time like there were like many people, many universities interested in 
these topics, but not necessarily like a Europe-based uh, conference to serve those needs. Thank you very much. Uh, Roshane, you've, uh, you've actually attended uh, both Mumi and CSMC, and you've hosted CSMC in 2018. What uh, can you reflect on the, the both of the communities and similarities and differences that you see? Um, it's a tricky one, really. I mean, I see, I, I do see a lot of similarities in, in the content. There's definitely, um, certainly in the papers, I feel there's a lot more in generation from from Mumi, and I think with CSMC, I think particularly when we had it in when I hosted it in Dublin. Um, when yeah we we had Tim Tim Blackwell as a um, as one of our keynotes like that that was already because of was because of the group that I was based in which isn't really a music group it was actually an evolutionary computational group so I really wanted to get somebody in who who had to make it relevant to where we, where where I was hosting it um, so I think there was certainly that year there might have been a bit more of a focus on you know the academic side of it rather than more into the music performance side. Um, but that was largely to do with, with, with my hosting of it. Um, but it was still a, a, a really engaging and really enjoyable conference. And there, there certainly there is a lot of um, overlap between the two, both in people who attend, people you get to know, um, and with the, ty the type of work. And I, I do think they complement each other very, very well. Um, I mean, personally, I, I always did enjoy it now when um, Moom which I still don't know if I'm calling it Moom or Moomy. <laughs> I keep switching, um, but I very Nobody much- Nobody knows, you will never know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I go with Moomy, I don't know why, I, I quite like that. Um, I did really enjoy when it was part of ICCC as well, because I really did enjoy the ICCC con uh, conference and it was a kind of natural add-on. Um, it, it did fit quite well. But I now really, really, particularly what I've seen, the, the amount and the breadth of work that we've seen this week really shows that bringing these two communities together could make AI music as, as a whole a, a force to be reckoned with at, as a conference. So I think I, I pers this is my, my personal opinion at the moment would be that to, to, to keep this going for a little while, see how we get on and we, we'll have to find other excuses to go attend ICCC. Yeah, I felt uh, when I attended the Mumi workshop, it felt like a, a day is not enough I would like more than than just a day. And one time there was a day and a half. I think in that second, that half day was demos and um, discussions, but it still wasn't enough. And so on my first, um, when I first envisioned the conference this year, it was going to be three days, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and I felt that would be a perfect amount. But now that we've had the enormous number of submissions with 52 papers and uh, um, the great uh, reception to the Spotlight Talks invitations that I sent out a week was just right. And the fact that it was virtual, that we could spread it through the day uh, and try to meet as many time zones as possible. Some of us had time to do work in between and take meetings and catch up with the, the uh, things that we missed on, on YouTube. I think that's worked very well. Artemi, how do you feel now for next year and continuing this joint collaboration between the two communities? Um, well, I'm, I'm excited, a little bit terrified as well. Um, as you have said, this, this has grown into a huge thing. Um, and I'm also, um, or we as a team um, are looking at how we can help this um, community grow and expand. And we are based at an arts university. So we are really trying to um, help and shift the focus a little bit towards uh, artistic practice. So um, this year for the first time, we will have an ensemble in residence, for example, so that people can uh, submit pieces for acoustic instruments or acoustic instruments or, and electronics or just fixed media pieces, just the live electronic performances. So we are really um, putting a lot of work into the music program and we are hoping to, to have a really uh, extensive music program this year. And the fact that you're very close to great research groups doing artificial intelligence and music 
as well in Vienna and uh, Linz that could we could uh, attract some great research from them. Is it too early to ask for interest for hosting 2022 when we can travel again? No, I that's think that's a very really good idea. Yeah, as a as a community, we're gonna try to maybe uh, organize a little. We were talking offline about maybe having a website, maybe starting a mailing list or merging some mailing lists. I think that Newm has a forum with with several hundred people uh, registered. Uh, we could try to turn that out and uh, yeah, try to organize a little bit, uh, taking the best of both worlds, and then uh, and then so we'll try to do that um, in collaboration with Artemi, of course, and see what can be done between now and then. But moving forward, uh, thinking of, of 2022 is a great idea. I think in the long term, that might be too early this time around, but in the long term, having a two year cycle is a great idea. The conferences that do that, they're obviously just ahead of the game. And that's something that is especially true for the artistic side of things. Organizing an, a purely academic conference is in fine, a fairly uh, simple thing, but organizing concerts bringing artists, having musicians, typically the grant system makes such that you need to apply two years before to get uh, the money before things happens and booking concert halls and, and venues is also a little bit of the same. And that's why Artemi, you can you can talk to that. I know you had the, the concert all booked a year and a half ago already or something like that for next year. Uh, so that was really challenging for us. Um, we need to book the concert hall here at our uh, university at least three years in advance. So um, I'm currently the principal investigator of uh, an artistic research project called Inter Interagency, and we are exploring applications of AI in electro-instrumental composition together with um, Gerhard Eckel, who is the project leader. So we originally uh, booked uh, the concert hall of the university for a final conference, a final event for our project. But then we thought, uh, wait a minute, why don't we host an already existing music AI conference and in that way just uh, contribute to uh, the development of a community that already exists instead of just doing a one-time event. So that's um, how I decided to contact Philippe and then Bob. But yeah, I mean, um, we had to book the concert hall three years ago, and that's why we weren't also very flexible with uh, the dates. I think what's important too, and what we can really take advantage of, is that our work cr cuts across uh, academic research, uh, industry, and artistic research, artistic practice. And one thing I tried to balance in the spotlight talks was uh, that we had practitioners talking about their art, and then we had representatives from industry, and then we had researchers, and some people that sit between the two, like Sven Albeck, who's both at the conservatory, but also spearheading a startup in uh, applying music informatics to music applications. And that's something that we could really uh, take advantage of. And in essence, we have three different audiences that we can invite to participate into this uh, research venue. So I ha don't see any qu comments yet on the panel. Uh, F Philippe Pasquier wrote that there's a, uh, oh yes, that's you, Philippe, Music Meta Creation uh, link there. While we wait for people to comment, how did you find the online format this year? Anyone would like to uh, talk to that? Yeah, I, th I think I can jump on this um, just because like, I was working throughout the week, uh, like with my company, uh, and I think like it would have been very, very difficult to uh, come to the physical uh, conference this year because like the, the work that we do at Museum Up is more into like music information retrieval, not necessarily AI music creativity. So. I don't think I could have justified like that one week uh, of going to a conference. And I think like this uh, version of the conference, which, which is like where you have basically like all the um, all the different sessions online, like is a, is a great help like, to people like me, who's not necessarily like into academia anymore, but it's like on the other side of the world, right? On the dark side of the moon. And, uh, and I think like sometimes like it can be difficult for people who work 
uh, in startups or at different like companies to just like take one week and go. Uh, and so in, in that respect, I, I felt like this was brilliant and it works perfectly for me because I could follow here and there uh, bits and pieces like uh, during uh, like work time, but also like on, on my like, free time. And, and some, some of these things I could follow like live and other things I could just like follow when, yeah, I mean, just like see the, watch the, the videos on YouTube after uh, the session. And, and that for me was like a great opportunity to be involved with the, with the conference, which otherwise I wouldn't have had, had it been uh, like a physical conference. I'm personally finding um, I've done, I think this is my third conference attendance online. Um, I guess probably Australia is more likely to have awkward um, uh, attendance times. Uh, and that actually goes both ways. Like as Valeria mentioned, um, so, so personally, I find it incredibly hard when I'm just doing, you know, at work and at home to switch into conference mode and, and actually pay attention. So I have not been following this conference particularly well, shame on me. Um, one of the things, of course, I love is that um, there's a really great effort to make sure everything's uh, continues to live online. And I think that's really key um, that we can go back. I believe that's right, that we can go back and, and look at everything, um, make it more asynchronous, just like the papers themselves. So I think that's fantastic. Um, and maybe maybe that's the solution for, for people like me who <laughs> just find it just really hard to kind of switch mode. Um, one thing I'd love to see on that front is, uh, is, is like some way that you could convert, um, YouTube videos or videos online to an actual podcast stream. I mean, I mean, that's obviously possible, but I reckon podcast streams are the way to get more consumption of academic talks because you can do that more in your, you know, spare time walking the dog or driving. I think a lot more people are, are in, in increasing the amount of gear they have for good sound, like this Yeti microphone. It's not very expensive, USB, powered mic, condenser. It does wonders. My students really enjoy the, the, the sound quality with a certain zoom setting with this microphone. So I think we can start to make uh, podcasts. And also one thing I've noticed, a lot of people did send me videos of their presentations and they're great they're very well produced and very well scripted and i've used i've put those all online yes you can review all the um the videos online uh, some may be editing still but it's all accessible and will be for this foreseeable future um anyone else want to comment about the the format no oh, yeah i mean the format is great and it's so great that uh, it's a little bit unfortunate because it might be the case that it would be less easy for all of us to just travel the world to talk for 15 minutes in a, in a conference with colleagues and, and enjoy a week uh, there. It's unfortunate because that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm in the job. Um, uh, even though traveling too much is also a problem, which is why I actually uh, stopped being a musician. Uh, fear of touring and, and not having a life was really an issue. Um, it also is, there's no perfect solutions and we all want to be in person but the truth is what, what I think is going to become normal is what we call flex which is um, they'll be eventually in person but then everything will be recorded and I think the recording is what's key because that allows for that asynchronous you know people like Valerio work during the day to, to catch up eventually just not three months later but just at a different time a little bit later and uh, and to follow stuff and i think that's going to become a norm and in terms of attendance it changes everything because i've been to i this year was fourteen thousand people online instead of you know they've never been that big in person and then if those vi videos stays online then you, you came a year later and then the papers that are actually really good then you can see the number of hits on those video and you can tell that um that you know that that's that's a good thing for the community it also cut on a on a growing market of people who actually make a job out of summarizing papers uh, in well-produced uh, videos and tutorials online. Like there's YouTubers whose job is become to just sort of replicate uh, online what is a conference pre presentation of those papers often. So there's uh, interesting dynamics around, you know, this, this move uh, that we've been all forced to do. 
So I would say, um, I think this has gone really, really well. I think one of the reasons has been the slack. Um, and I think actually, low on one level is a small thing. The fact there was a slack uh, channel for each session, I think is um, really important. And, and I think if that remains for some time as, as a sort of, sort of archive, I think that's, that's actually quite useful because I think there's some quite interesting information on that Slack channel. So I think in, I mean, although it'd be great for everyone to meet, in some ways, I think this does work very, very well because probably a lot more people can attend. Obviously you've got the carbon footprint thing. Um, and I almost wonder whether for an international conference, international conferences should be online. And it seems to me that one, one thing you miss is really networking face-to-face. And I just wonder whether those should be separate events, maybe more local events. Um, you know, maybe it may, you know, from, for example, within the UK. I mean, for example, Queen Mary is um, uh, there's a lot there's a lot of people working at Queen Mary on, on related topics to this. And for someone like the me, the OU, where there's only a couple of people, you know, the ability to go down to Queen Mary and meet a load of people is where I could potentially do the networking without ne necessarily travelling internationally. Um, to network, if you see what I mean. Um, so I, I think a different ecology maybe will will arise out of this. And I, and I think there could be some advantages to that. I think also having, oh, sorry, go on. Go on. Um, Russian had a hand up before me. <laughs> uh, well, well, it was just come in there in Robin's point, and I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I completely, I would have made all the, all the same points, I, but I, I, I just think we still do need to acknowledge that not meeting up in person at conferences could have a negative effect on certain people. And specifically, I'm thinking maybe students or people who aren't well known in the community. And to, like, I mean, I've met everyone on this call before at either MUMI or CSMC, and I don't work with anyone who works in this field. So it, only by attending these conferences have I got involved. And without that, personally, that, that would have been quite difficult for me. So, you know, there, there is, I think if you're well connected before you even go to a conference, you're fine. You're going to be connected either way. But if you're using um, conferences as a way to get involved with other people, it, I, there's no way around it. It's just not the same online. It, it, just, it just isn't. You don't have the coffee breaks. You don't have sitting beside somebody at a meal or sitting at a, conference, at a concert. I, I completely love Slack and I think this has been done absolutely brilliantly, but I think we'd be naive to say that you wouldn't be missing some social element by not meeting up. I just want to leave that there. <laughs> I, mean, I would agree with that. I mean, it seems to me that, um, you know, the ability for students to meet uh, experienced people, um, I agree that's very, very important. And I always wonder whether um, I mean, like the, the, the mentoring scheme that um, women, women in MIR have, that strikes me that, that that allows for possibly quite close connections um, between diff people with different levels of experience, which actually benefits both parties, of course, is quite important. So, so I, I almost wonder whether, yeah, I mean, I think there will still be some international conference, and I completely accept, accept, accept what you've said. But I think if there are times when we're constrained to this format, then we should maybe be thinking more about what sort of international mentoring schemes can be put in place. Yep. Following on from that, um, I see that Jason's put a comment in the chat uh, about um, software for virtual poster presentations. Uh, and that's often a very good way for beginning researchers, students to get their work uh, known and to get feedback on it. So, um, if we're trying to broaden out and give a range of opportunities to different researchers at different stages of their career, perhaps the next iteration, if we are still um, online, either wholly or in part, should perhaps give some consideration to that sort of um, kind of way of nurturing new researchers. I think um, also we had, uh, if, if people attended IEEC this year, uh, if anyone made it to the um, co-creativity workshop that um, was organized by um, Anna Cantasalo and uh, a bunch of other people. I was also one of the co-organizers of that. Um, we had uh, a Miro board and we had um, 
everyone come into the workshop and we did lots of brainstorming and breakout sessions. We, we started off by posing some questions, um, then we invited people to join different groups. The groups were based on time zones, so you always had a group that you could join, which was a bit weird actually because it meant that people ended up clustering with their fellow colleagues, but um, nevertheless, that I really felt like I met people and the, and particularly for students, I think there was a sense. So I put out I put out a PhD call that we have at the moment and we got a lot of responses from that. Um, obviously, at, you know, dedicated social sessions are, are fine, but I think those kinds of more freeform brainstorming academic sessions with no particular, you know, no, no pressure um, and just a chance to really have ideas was in, in my experience so far, the best way to do socialising online, it was socialising around an academic theme. I attended parts of Izmir last week, uh, which was a very instructive thing uh, to do before I was going to host a virtual conference as well. But uh, one thing I, I really appreciated about that conference is that they've adopted a format of all poster presentations and you have essentially four minute ted talk about your your research and you go to the poster afterwards in uh, and then it was actually on slack and you call into the posters and you could you know discuss with the person on a zoom chats or whatever their work and the website that they created for the izmir uh, conference it's available. It's you can see and download the papers and everything. It's a great design, but it was a one-way. Well, it was, yeah, it was mix, missing that social interaction. And actually, running this conference, it was enjoyable because I felt like I had social interaction with everybody before the session. I could catch up with the the chairs or the the authors, which is good. I also, I also think, Bob, you've just done a really great job making use of all of the most standard tools out there so everybody was familiar with, um, you know, Slack and uh, Zoom and the idea of putting that through a YouTube stream just so that the consumption is really, really straightforward. I think all of that worked incredibly well. And some of the conference experiences I've had have been with these slightly more complicated high-end systems. I haven't seen any obvious advantage of those so far. I don't know if people have seen anything different, but just just using all of these free tools to the best of their ability works really well. It was a bit scary at times because YouTube has algorithms that detect copyright infringement automatically. And when Nick Collins <clears throat> started to play a, a sample of a copyright protected song, I was afraid we would be given a takedown notice. <laughs> so there are uh, disadvantages there. I will be writing up a blog post about what to do and what not to do and how to prepare for such a thing, which would be uh, useful for Artemy, I believe, next year. We have a comment from Oded Bintal that we should aim for a physical conference next year. Hope is useful when we head into winter, of course, but the reality is, is different. Ali, you said that you're not planning on traveling for the next year, as are most Australians. It's uh, it's not my plans. It's the government. They're they're making that quite clear, and and the thing is that um, the university is also uh, with, with all of the insurance and risk. The university wouldn't. Uh, it would be pretty clear about that too. It's hard to tell when this is going to change because it's all depending on vaccination and things. But uh, it takes a lot of time to just bring one. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the dean for dance and, and music and all sort of things at SFU. And just opening one studio with three students in it, the studio is massive, is, is, is complicated enough. So it's going to take time to go back to normal uh, uh, for sure. So, so we'll see. Roche? Yeah, so I just a point as well for the idea of going back to normal. If it's if it's not next year, if it's the year after, and I'm just thinking of like funding proposals for for people who are maybe trying to get funded PhDs or postdocs or whatnot. There's always you know the travel budget in there, and how quickly will it be that the funders decide well you don't need that much money to go to these conferences? You know, like if if there's particularly if we talk about a blended situation, maybe where some go some parts are online and some parts aren't. Um, I, we all know how hard it is to get funding. So I'm, 
once they realize they don't have to give us that money, it could become a bit of an issue quite quickly to actually get the money should conferences go back to being physical. And I have a funny feeling that that might end up, you know, shaping this landscape a little bit in the future. Um, you know, particularly the you know the, the carbon footprint is obviously a, an important thing as well so the, the funders will find plenty of reasons not to give us money to go places so i just wouldn't be surprised if within three to five years there's, there's, there's a very big difference in the amount of funding you get for attending conferences annually That's... yeah ali you have some comments about concerts i'd like to hear uh yeah if it's an appropriate time to go back um that way. Um, so I'm really, really excited to hear that um, Artemis has, has got a uh, an ensemble lined up because I've seen that uh, that can really raise um, the, the game. Um, and that's obviously a, a common tradition we see in con conferences like ICMC and sometimes in NIME. Um, we, we, uh, we managed to get ourselves almost to that point, I think, in um the last mume concert we did is that really true that the last mume one was atlanta 2017 maybe oh no there was one in 2018 I, but i wasn't involved in it um yeah 2018. and yeah i just wanted to raise the question and, and, and get other people's input from their experiences um so a couple of different things like one is uh the the various genres of um ai and music um performance that you can do and how they differ um and the other is just the question of how you uh, balance between the musical quality and the ai technical quality of the work um, i think th those are both questions that we've um uh, throughout the years of organizing moon concerts um spent a lot of time talking about and there's a, a bit of that discussed in a 2013 paper that we co-authored about the, the musical meta creation weekend um which is the one we did in sydney so the so the one thing um, the genre thing is is interesting because um, in my experience you um, you have these quite different little kind of silos of AI music performance style and and of course you have everything in between but um, we found there's there's some quite clear clustering such as the standard format sort of duo, improvised duo, um, man-machine duo type thing. Um, and uh, and then Bob's been doing these absolutely wonderful uh, sessions with um, your folk music focus, which is, um, I don't know if I've ever been to one live, but I assume it's just largely live musicians reading scores, computer-generated scores. Is that is that right? Yeah, kind um, of, yeah. Yeah, um, and and just I mean, sorry to to bring my massive sprawl to a to a simple point, which is that I I found that you really need to have people with the expertise and the energy in each of those genres to really make those kick. Uh, so, for example, I've been doing stuff where I'm trying to organise ensemble musicians and scores, and I do not have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable with um, kind of rugged free improv or something more rave focused. Um, so I don't know, it's a comment and a question to everyone in the panel and to people on Slack um, about that. And then, and then the, the, the music quality versus AI quality is one that um, has, is just comes up time and time again. Uh, and particularly pertinent, I think, with, the, with that um, Eurovision competition that uh, I was involved in and Bob was involved in, um, where you've, that they, they did quite an interesting job of, of balancing the judgment by basically just having a sort of popular popular vote and then having an expert panel looking at the actual systems and discussing the systems. And I thought that was quite successful. Um, so again, comments welcome from everyone here or, or on Slack. Yeah, organiz organizing concerts is definitely really hard because typically that works by niche. And in our community, a lot of the system agnostic and the research is touching upon almost every gender. And it's almost like concepts are like breakout room, like, uh, you know, not, not everyone is necessarily interested uh, in a given concert, independently of the quality of the music. Uh, unless, you know, some people are very, very open, but not everyone can listen to, um, I love CG's music, for example, but not everyone can sit a 45 minute session of that, um, you know, heavy metal or 
kind of noise, noise music and and same with you know techno versus classical music and things like that there's people who would have less favorite musics at some stage and so that's that's a challenge another dimension that i wanted to raise that we miss as well uh, when we move online is uh, demos and all these uh, moments especially when you want to involve the industry where you want to have people who feel free to show you a system that is not necessarily available online because some systems are very hard to be made available online for many reasons and that's something that we did quite a bit of uh, uh, during Noom and we had also some industry session and people from Isotop and other companies coming to talk to, to uh, our community and uh, I wish I wish indeed and I think you mentioned it top uh, Bob that uh, we continue doing that because there is a surge of um, my students and plenty of other labs are just uh, producing PhD in those areas. And there's a surge of startups and uh, and even big players are taking those uh, those work seriously increasingly. And so it, it would be missing out to not, for the sake of our students, to not uh, have this part of the community being connected to the conference. And it's really hard to bring together the three: the academic, the artistic, and the industry. And the industry, in a way. Yeah, I, I can't reflect just a little bit on the industry side of things because I mean it's been like my activity for the last like five, four or five years now, and I think like yeah over the last like few years there's been like a surge as Philip said in like the number of startups that are doing AI music. This is definitely true for music information retrieval uh, startups, but lately it's also true for generative music startups and i and i feel like juke tech was the one which kind of like opens away initially and then after that we started to see like a lot of new startups popping up my personal impression is that none of these startups has so far us included when i when i was working with melodrive figured out like the way to actually turn really cool technology into what like makes an actual product sellable uh, on a market but this is like a totally other uh, like topic that i don't want to like uh get into but the point is that the request for uh people who are skilled in ai music generation is kind of like rising and i see that and i have like a lot of like friends and colleagues who ask me uh like to like point me to to people who are strong like in AI music generation or like music informatics like more in general and I feel there's a little bit of a uh, disconnect between what is like the academic world and the, the industry and specifically the startup world that has its own roles it has like its own workflows and like these two worlds don't necessarily like talk to each other very much and I think like a I venue uh, like this conference is definitely like something that should try to tap into like that problem and address it. So I think like Bob did an amazing uh, job this year inviting a lot of like people from the industry and and I think like this like should continue and probably even like involve like I don't know like the, the people who are more into like production code and that kind of stuff or just like hackers so having for example like an, an, a hackathon could be like a great way of like bridging the gap and, and bringing in also people who are not necessarily super interested into the academic side but uh, have been active very much into the more like hacky uh, part of like what is and what makes like music mass creation or generative, uh, generative music more in general yeah and those spotlights, Bob, that you included, that's really a brilliant idea um, and taking advantage for once of the fact that we are online because flying all those people would have been expensive and maybe difficult. But then all of a sudden, artists who are not going to submit a paper, industrials that are not going to submit a paper, then you can get you know, them to talk for 30 minutes and they would do so gladly. So that, that was well done. I think we should try to keep that. I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I mean, every one of the spotlights to me was memorable and they had uh, uh, sort of in this trying time they all each had a, a voice of optimism i think in how they're working through the the situation and sometimes taking uh, inspiration from it so i was very happy to see that um anna jordanus says that uh, with regards to concerts we have to regard uh, performance quality are we going to watch someone sitting at a laptop um, or more visual aspects. So following on to that is Oded Ben Paul, who was uh, one of the members of the music jury, actually, for the online exhibition. 
who says that when selecting the work for that exhibition, uh, which we were hoping to have a concert, but we tried to balance the technical and musical side and we hope we got a good outcome, but it'd be nice to hear if, if we did. Have uh, some of you been able to experience some of the works in the online exhibition and, and what are your thoughts of that? Uh oh. <laughs> I mean, I've listened to a, a few works in between breaks. And uh, like Robert Laidlow's piece is a really beautifully presented recording. Uh, very impressive piece, uh, theatrical and musical all, all at the same time. Of course, I was there for the recording of the Champernown the string quartet produced by Music from EdTech, so I'm already familiar with that, and Oded Bintal's piece. But that exhibition is going to remain online as an artifact of the, of the uh, conference. And I was quite happy to see uh, overlap between some of the research presented here, in particular um, from OpenAI, Christine's um, Payne's work on Jukebox and how that had found uh, application in Robert Laidlow's piece composition. So that was nice to see that overlap. And I've always preferred, since I come from the computer music crowd, and I first started to attend International Computer Music Conference way back in 1999, those papers that were also demonstrated as pieces, or you know, you had a research component, a scientific component, and then another piece of evidence of its usefulness is in the piece on the concert that you heard maybe the next day. And those pairs of pieces and and piece and um, and research, I think, should be encouraged in this conference going forward too. So I actually have something to add to that. So um, in in this call, so in next year's conference, we are actually going to add a, a piece and paper category because um, I also liked listening to um, artists talking about their work in this conference and I think we need more of this. We need to hear more about what artists are interested in and their perspectives on AI which sometimes are a little bit non-conventional, a bit critical and I think we need that too and most importantly we need an exchange between the composers and the um, technology developers so I, th I think that's that's the most important part of this and I think it's something that both sides can benefit from reading. Yeah, I agree that in Mume there, there was a session sometime after concerts uh, where people can ask and very often people would have much, much more questions after having seen a piece than before and uh, all sorts of curiosity and thoughts have, um, have come to mind that, that you know you can't anticipate before you experience the work. So that, that would be really good to, to carry on as well, uh, Artemi. I can see how that would work really well. With concert, another thing that I would recommend, but it's really hard to do, is to really, and I think a well-equipped our team in this case, but to really try to decouple it from the academic conference and almost have a different team. And if possible, a team that already exists. So for example, if I was to do things now again with, like we did with Isaiah with Mutech. So Mutech, that's what they do. They run the largest um, contemporary electronic music festival in Canada. And if you work with them, they, they, they're gonna know how to do that very well. And they have their own audience. And that way you can really have this cross pollination where you have a, an organic audience that really comes for the music. And so of course it has to be good. And then uh, you have, um, and then you have the academic community that is, that is there usually in smaller numbers uh, that is also appreciative of, of seeing the, the pieces. And I think there's really a lot of work for us to do here because then the audience sort of get to know a little bit about the conference and there might be some sessions in which, uh, or some, uh, speech that are made public in which the, we can uh, grow a community that way and some interest and uh, get approached as well by the media and, and all that. So that's quite uh, take a bit of work and we're still a small community, but those are things to think about as, uh, as we grow. And, uh, was there somebody who had their hand raised? Okay, so I think we have about uh, 12 minutes to go. And at this time, I would like to announce as one of the, the major outcomes of this conference 
is a special issue of the Journal for Creative Music Systems, which will be uh, co-edited by uh, Anna Jardanus and Philippe Pasquier. And the, uh, a select group of papers will be invited from this conference. Uh, and those, those papers uh, will be announced sometime within the next week, week and a half. And further details will be uh, provided for uh, ways to submit uh, work to the paper, uh, to the special issue as well. But that'll be invited very soon. Very excited to, to see that come to fruition. Is there anything to add to that, Philippe? I think that's a, a, a good summary. Yeah, and uh, we're we happy that um, some of those papers are going to be eventually improved and uh, go into full journal submissions. Perfect. Okay, um, Artemy, so many details have already been mentioned about the conference next year, but uh, you have the floor to, to describe it more fully now. Yeah, sorry, that was a big spoiler alert, but yeah, I felt I had to explain why I am in this panel. So yeah, as we've um, already announced, the second conference on AI music creativity will be um, hosted by the Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics of the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz, Austria. Um, the conference will take place uh, from the 18th until the 22nd of July, 2021. And the submissions will open soon on the 15th of November. So stay tuned for that. Um, as we've already mentioned, we, we don't know yet whether the conference will take place in Graz physically or whether it will be held uh, virtually. Um, but uh, if we're able to welcome you here in Graz, it will be at the House of Music and Music Theatre. It's a really beautiful um, building designed by Dutch architect uh, Ben van Perkel. Um, the Ligeti Hall, the concert hall, um, is a concert hall with uh, 3D high order ambisonics and adaptable staging and acoustics. And there's also um, a beautiful foyer area for sound installations. Uh, I also wanted to announce the theme of next year's conference, which is dual performing machines and performing with machines. And with this title, we really want to shift the focus towards um, uh, human machine partnerships in performative contexts. And we're hoping to bring artistic practice to the foreground. Um, so I, I haven't been able to listen to all the paper sessions this year, but um, I heard some of the presentations and it was really interesting work. There were some really complex models. Uh, there were systems for music generation, for machine listening, so the question we invite you to ask next is, how can these tools be useful for artists? And what value do they add to artistic practice? And the, the concept value here does not only refer to um, uh, user studies and qualitative or quantitative uh, evaluation. That's these approaches are of course, as always uh, welcome, but we also invite you to think about these things on a philosophical level. So we invite you to ask questions such as, what does it mean to perform with a machine? What does it mean to compose for or with a machine? And how does that challenge our understanding of authorship, of performership, of musicianship in general? Um, as I mentioned, there will be a piece and paper category this time. So we really invite artists to submit their pieces and papers describing these pieces. We're uh, really hoping that we will receive a lot of these papers because we want to be able to discuss um, AI music creativity in both a scientific and an artistic context. We think that's, that's really um, important. Um, so, uh, yeah, Alice Eldridge finished her um, keynote speech uh, with um, a quote by Floridi, which um, I thought summarizes very, uh, very beautifully the challenges that AI is facing right now. So I would like to end with that. 
uh, we need to resist oversimplification. This time, let us think more deeply and extensively on what we are doing and planning with AI. The exercise is called philosophy, not futurology. So I thought that was a really beautiful quote. And with that in mind, I want to invite everyone to participate in a discussion that's centered not just around the how, but also around the why behind AI music creativity. And we are really looking forward to receiving everyone's contributions and looking forward to meeting you all uh, in July, um, hopefully in person, but if not, then virtually. Thank you very much, Artemi. I'm looking very forward to it. Are there any final words before we uh, close the panel and then I close the conference? Well, just a massive thank you to you, Bob. You've been uh, carrying that on your uh, on your solid shoulders, and uh, I know you did you did share with uh, with um, we miss uh, the other Bob Bob, Bob Keller uh, last year the the new uh, workshop. But it's it's great that that you've been uh, doing that twice in a row, and I hope you're gonna enjoy uh, the the well deserved rest that you'll get uh, after after the conference. I completely agree with all of that. And can I say as well, I really loved the um, the opening animation that all the sessions opened with. I just thought it was a really nice idea going around the world and really good music going along to it as well. So congratulations, Bob. Job. Job Thank really you very much. Oh, thank you. I mean, it was incredibly impressive. It was an incredibly rich conference, incredibly well organized. Um, I mean, I've just, I'm, actually astounded just how well it's gone. I mean, I mean, obviously being online doesn't make it easy, um, but I'm very, very impressed. I mean, just the, the, lev the academic level and the level of the artistic inputs and so on. Very, very impressed indeed. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank I think you. this is def definitely a sign of the way forward and I'm really looking forward to many more years of this conference and it's, uh, this, is, this is an amazing year, an amazing moment. Thank you very much. Uh, Ali will share my screen and then close out with some uh, some thank yous and summaries. You can see my slides, I hope. And they change. Okay, so the uh, this conference I envisioned is, is a convolution of two existing communities and I'm really happy to see how well it's gone. Uh, I have big thanks for the steering committee, the uh, recently deceased Robert Keller. We had a, a wonderful opening tribute to him, but also members of the Mumi community, Philippe Pasquier, and co-members of both CSMC and Mumi, Anna Jordanis and Roshane Lafren, and members of CSMC, Robin Laney, Stephen Jan, and Valerio Villardo. The organization of this conference, I've had a massive amount of help from Andy Elmsley, who's done a, a great job handling submissions and in fact I had several submissions I had to mark with a, um, a conflict of interest because I knew them and that meant I could no longer see any of the reviews or the scores and so all of a sudden I couldn't I thought we had far fewer papers and Andy uh, thankfully was able to handle all of that on his uh, on his shoulders also, Matthias Schuld on handling the, the music submissions with help from Oded Bintal. And Oded has actually been very helpful in helping me plan a variety of aspects of this conference and uh, suggestions of, of several spotlight talks to, uh, to this conference. And thank you for handling the panels as well. Also, Iris Wren has, has helped on getting the tutorials together and she's been uh, sending helpful messages during the, uh, during the workshop, the conference, that everything is running smoothly on her end in the Netherlands. Andre Holtzapfel has also been very helpful in sending out the publicity at, from which we've gotten a phenomenal response of uh, over 200 registrants to this conference and of course 52 submissions of papers. I'd also like to thank the paper session chairs for their uh, wonderful um, handling of the, the sessions. Each of them handled the, the, the papers very well with the uh, on time and we didn't really ever have to use the 15 minute buffer that uh, we had put in for any technical difficulties or people running over time. 
The spotlight chairs have done a fantastic job introducing the uh, spotlights and the, uh, two wonderful keynotes from Dr. Alice Eldridge and Professor Dr. Johan Sunberry. Also, the Spotlight presenters have made a, a phenomenal contribution to this conference, providing, uh, as I said before, messages of hope in, in these times and great perspectives from a variety of disciplines. Also, a big thanks to the Technical Paper Committee for handling the uh, a large number of uh, papers when we saw how many submissions we actually had received we rushed to to find more reviewers because we were only expecting maybe 30 tops but 52 came in so we had to uh, jump on that and thank you so much for your hard efforts in creating good high quality reviews also big thanks to the authors the composers and the artists who have contributed to the online exhibition to the tutors and to the panelists, to the people that registered and to the online viewers as well. And I think actually uh, having this uh, broadcast over YouTube live has shown people are very interested in watching this. We've had over 4,000 views. This was taken actually earlier this morning. So it's probably increased more than that. 813 hours of watch time across those 4,000 reviews. And it'll be interesting to see how these numbers change over the coming months. Um, the most viewed video is actually uh, the keynote by Alice Eldridge and 303 views since just a, a few minutes ago. And also the AI Music Creativity channel has 161 subscribers to it. So that's a great sign. Also, the big uh, funding for this conference comes from my ERC grant, which just started in October. This is uh, Music of the Frontiers of Artificial Creativity and Criticism. It's going to be, this was the actual opening of the, the, um, the ERC project. I will have three PhD positions opening next year, and the announcement is coming in December. And I will also have one two-year postdoc, which will start in 2022, but the announcement will be late 2021. My first postdoc starts in uh, a few months. Also, a big thanks to my wife, Carla, and our little doggy, Shugi Nol Nol who's had to uh, be without, uh, without me for the week and also be without the wireless while I, had, I needed to make sure I had a steady connection. So thank you all very much and uh, stay healthy, stay well, and, and uh, we'll see you in less than a year.